Let's get things started. First off this morning, we are kicking off with a superstar session. Uh, we're looking at why protection matters with Kurt from De Nouveau by Erdetto. So let's see if we can pull Kurt in from the green room where he's been enjoying a virtual coffee and hopefully a virtual bacon sandwich. Here he is, fabulous, joining us through the miracle of technology. Good morning, right. Kurt. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Not at all. Thank you very much indeed for agreeing to talk to us this morning. Um, where are you joining us from? I'm in Austria, Salzburg. Oh, fabulous. Oh, what an amazing city. I have been there a grand total of once and I had plans to go back and then the world stopped. So um, I have to get back. I have to get back in. And autumn and winter are uh, an, an amazing time to go, I believe. It's also nice in summer, but yeah, it's most famous for skiing, I guess. I guess so. I, I, I don't ski, I fall over. Um, and so the higher the mountain, the, the, the further it is to fall. But uh, I, I do love the place. Are you all ready for us this morning, Kurt? I'm super ready. Excellent. In that case, I will fade into the background. I will leave you to get on. I will join you at the end. Uh, Kurt, take it away. So I'm, I'm Kurt. I'm working at um, the Nuvo Bay Data. I'm working in the mobile team. And as a software engineer and yeah, we, we do mobile protection. And today I would like to talk about why protection matters in order to protect your revenue from your games. Um, sorry, okay, now it works. So, um, sorry, just a second, like Zoom pops up. Yeah, so Denuvo is world's number one games protection platform. So it's pretty well known for all pro uh, protecting most of the PC AAA games, right? And uh, our parent company, Adetto, also brings in a ton of security expertise. So, and with combined forces, we are trying to build a, a secure future. So, uh, uh, I tried to came up with some numbers about the mobile gaming market, and especially last year, it, uh, like the demand, it highly, the, the, it highly grew, right? Which was also because, of course, but you do it to the pandemic, so. Which is like most amazing to me is like uh, the App Store, like 66% from the App Store revenue actually coming from mobile games. So that's some great numbers for us as mobile protection, also for US game publisher. So, but also with all this uh, rise, um, also the piracy increased. And uh, we had a lot of customers who, who noticed like a high increase of uh, cracked games. And with this uh, high increase uh, of, uh, of cracking, the, the revenue um, decreased, of course. So this, uh, so what are the the, the most uh, threats mobile games threat uh, face? And the number one is a uh, tampered version. So that's like the, the huge number one, especially on Android, where you uh, statically analyze a game, you find some weaknesses, and then you redistribute your your modified version. Uh, on iOS, the, the 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 thing works a bit different because like redistributing an the IPA doesn't work that easily due to all Apple standards protection. So what you do there is like you install so-called like tweaks, which are cheat scripts and which modify the runtime behavior of your application. Um, so to get a better overview of the, the market, we this summer we analyzed the top 50 Google Play Store games and checked off so how many cheats are actually available, right? And we found out that out of those 50, like 50% uh, actually had working cheats. 40% um, uh, had a cheat available, but it wasn't up to date. So like the update cycle on mobile is like pretty frequently. And once uh, a cheat has to be updated as well. And if it, that isn't done, the cheat doesn't work anymore. So in the end, that leaves us with 49% uh, of tempered versions. And taking a, a look at the second threat uh, memory editors, we also found like 60%, 16% of all these games had working editor scripts available. So summing this up, those are pretty scary numbers. And yeah. Um, so taking a look at these numbers, the, the, the question is, of course, how, how, how does cheats created in the first place? And the two main ways, as I already stated, are static tampering, where you download your, the released app, you, you go through the code, you find functions which are worth to patch and modify, then you re-sign it, and then you distribute it. So that's like 
on Android, that's like pretty common. On iOS, the most uh, the, the most common way are dynamic modifications. So, so you still have this initial step of analysis and then and finding functions, but you don't patch it and redistribute it. Instead, you write a script which patches this code at runtime, and then you distribute the script instead of a new IPA. So uh, having an example of untampered app uh, with the Hungry Shark game we analyzed, I guess, was last year. So here we can see like the gold is like always the maximum amount. And here it's like the cheetah just found a function which returns the gold and then patches it to always return the maximum amount of gold. So how this looks in a bit more detail is um, talking especially about Unity games for a hacker, it's possible to retrieve or like to get or to resolve all these function names again. And once you find like descriptive function names, which are called get currency, the attacker doesn't even need to understand the assembly code anymore. All he sees is like, okay, this function returns an integer and it's called get currency. So most likely it will return the currency. And then he simply patches, patches it to always return the maximum amount of number. Uh, what we got in recent years from customers was that they were always surprised on once they have a cracked version out there and they push an update, how fast the update gets cracked as well. And this is due to cheat automation. So on Unity games, that's especially easy because you take this global metadata file, which contains all these function descriptions, and then you put it in tools like il 2 cpp dumper, and then you get out um, like really descriptive names. So you take this blob of data, put it into il 2 cpp dump, and what you get out looks like something like that. And next to the function signature, you also get, and that's important, the offset, like the offset where this function is in the actual game library. So in this step can be easily automated and you know where to apply your patches. So taking a look at the second biggest threat is uh, Mem which are memory editors. So those happens by tools like Game Guardian. And those work, um, you scan through the app memory and you scan for, in this case, the value 600, which is, which is the health bar of the hero. And you find a bunch of locations which contain 600. So you continue your gameplay, you get a bit of damage, and out of this um, value, which previously had stored 600, at least one must be now 480, right? Because that's most likely than the health failure. And in this case, we got lucky, there is exactly one left. If there are still more left, you can just do the procedure again, get more damage, and hopefully there will be only one left after a while. So once we have this one memory location, what we can do is we simply freeze it. And by freezing, it means we continuously write uh, like 600 to it, every, to this memory location every millisecond. In freezing this memory value, we can't get, we can't die anymore, right? Because it, the, um, the health bar is always reset. Um, so, so as this was all like now examples on Android, the same example, uh, like the same threads exist on iOS, right? But there, just the distribution works uh, different. The, just the distribution is different, right? Like here you distribute this cheat script, you install it on your jailbroken device, and then, yeah, you get these nice pop-ups where you can choose different options of your cheat. So um, talking about all these threats, um, the next logical question is what we can do against it, right? So, and now I just want, would like to talk about a, a, some simple steps everybody can do in order to, to raise the power of security. So depending, and the first one is uh, enabling optimization. So depending on your development EDE, there are some default settings. Unfortunately, not a lot, but there are some. So talking about Unity, you can, for example, strip the unneeded engine code or minify your, your Java part. And on Unreal has these really nice settings where you can hide a symbol visibility. So uh, symbols are like function names. And as we saw before, like uh, descriptive function names, you don't want to have that in your final game. So and with this option, you can disable or like remove them basically. If you want to go more into detail, uh, Unity has this super nice setting 
that you can add additional IL to CPB arcs. This means you can directly forward um, uh, compilation or optimization um, flags to your compiler and also to your linker. And especially the linker stuff is pretty nice because on Unity, what you can do is you can pass in linker version script. So seeing this linker version script, it defines your symbol visibility. And uh, uh, the, the Unity game library only needs this ILTC CPP standard functions to be actually uh, exported, right? So uh, setting this linker version script, you can actually reduce um, the amount of exported symbols, which reduces your final game library by about 15% in comparison to the standard uh, Unity build. And we, we, this is pretty amazing because in, we, we get that a lot that customers um, can't reduce, like have troubles reaching this 100 megabyte APK limit. So now it got better with AAP, but still that existed a lot in the past. For Unreal, you have the same, although not that easily accessible, but the settings exist in, this, in the Android tool chain file. Um, the second thing is um, avoiding plain strings. So we talked about the export, but furthermore, like um, th just descriptive strings like rules or error messages, like error messages, um, I saw a lot in the past. And like having some error messages in a function, even though you don't have a name, you can guess what it, this function will do, be doing just by reading these error messages. So a super simple approach to avoid those plain strings is just by not storing this as, them as a plain string in your APK, instead you encrypt them and only decrypt them once you're using them, right? So it's the same functionality, but save, no plain strings anymore. And the third one is um, moving game critical logic to the server. Right, uh, we saw the example with the get cold gold function, but this function doesn't ever need to be there, right? Like you could remove it, and once you've removed the function, there is no place to patch. Like for example, you can just simply rewrite it, um, in only to make a server request, right? You, instead of checking the gold on the client, what you do is like you send a request to the server and say like, oh, this player wanna buy this item, can he afford it, and stuff like that. So there's no more code in the, in the actual client, which you can easily patch. So just to sum up these uh, simple steps, it's like enabling optimization of our plain strings and move critical logic to the server, like uh, increases just the initial amount of time and hacker needs to investigate to crack a net. Or of course, if you don't wanna do that, you can give us a call. And we are of course, sure happy to help you with all our experience. So how our, um, just talking uh, briefly about our product is how this works, uh, the Denuvo mobile protection is uh, once a customer approaches us, we send them out um, like our integration client, which is like a small binary, which you can integrate in your CI pipeline. And um, all this, um, this uh, client does is next to the standard APK build, it also fetches the LLVM bit code, uploads both to our servers and then we protect them on our server. So we purely work on the LLVM bit code, which just allows us a great flexibility and a tight integration into the game itself to avoid a performance impact. So we protect it and then we send it back. So we have a bunch of dynamic uh, protection features. So integrity verification. So those like uh, modified distributions will not work anymore. Oh, and of course, all these classic checks, right? Like anti-debugging, hook detection, root detection, and also emulator detection. So while those are all dynamic protections, we also have, of course, static protection. So we put uh, obfuscation on top of all these uh, kind of protection. Just if you wanna try and give it a try and analyze it statically in tools like IDA, you, you can't basically you can't read it anymore with these kinds of uh, obfuscation. And if you can't read it, you can't analyze it, right? So it's actually pretty simple. Um, once you detect, uh, like one, once one of our checks trigger, like the game is running on a root device, then of course you have to um, do certain action based on that. And instead of simply crashing the app, what you can do with our solution is you can send telemetry requests and then um, act 
on your own what you want to do with this player, right? If you want to ban it or whatever. And all these statistics uh, will be provided by our mobile telemetry solution. So, and the last thing I would like to talk about is, so uh, next up, not the usual product, uh, also one of our duties is to monitor protecting protected games. So of course, once a protected game is out there, we also want to know um, when it get cracked and how it get cracked, of course, right, to improve our solution. So in test this, um, there was this uh, situation like half a year ago or a year ago, where we, uh, we where we had where we were monitoring this forum um, of a cheat uh, of a game which had like really a lot of cheats, and then once the customer approached us, yeah, please help us and to protect our game. And once we applied our protection, it was pretty nice to read that. Um, yeah, the admin responded. Um, we had a game added protection now, and my mod will not work anymore. So basically, what we can say now, right, is yeah, job done, like right, and and start celebrating basically. But actually, that that raised the thought in us because like this response from the admin came so quickly and it was so short, and then it was like it it didn't feel like he really tried, right? He it didn't like thought like that he put a lot of effort in. So what we came up with. Uh, based on this experience and of several others as well, is um, the, the mobile vault. So we thought he did, as he didn't really try, so maybe our super fancy advanced solution wouldn't have been even necessary. And a more like a, fa a fast and um, like a smaller protection would have been already enough to keep this kind of hackers away. So with mobile vault, we want to address that. Um, address that and want to bring out next to our base product a more fast and lightweight solution with zero performance impact because like most of the protection happens in the game startup and now zero integration so there will be no client anymore so how this works is we could in theory directly take um, already a released game from the apk play store uh, from the play store i'm sorry um, protect it on our servers and send back to you so we don't um um, need the LLVM bitcode anymore, but of course now that we can't um, that tightly integrate it, but in the end we can still do a lot of security. And yeah, and then once it's protected, we can send it back to you. And so, like the big thing here is like the zero integration effort. It's easy and it's easy to use. And yeah, we are planning to do the same on on iOS. So, and that uh, actually concludes my talk. We got some great uh, feedback from customers, which encourages us and also motivates us. And that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I, I'm, I'm in the Discord and I will also, yeah, I'm open for questions. Fantastic. That's wonderful stuff, Kurt. Thank you very much. What a, uh... Uh, an intense way to kick off uh, the last day of the conference and some really, really valuable information in there. And uh, our audience have been going crazy in the Q&A. There's a, a lot here and um, we've got a few minutes left. So I'm going to dive straight into the questions, if that's OK with you. Sure, sure, sure. I tried to be fast. First question is, is it harder to pr protect children uh, on mobile or PC or console? Sorry again. How is it harder to protect children on mobile over PC and console? Which is the hardest one to sort of take care of, of younger players? I don't, sorry, I don't. <laughs> like, it, sorry, okay, let me, let me rephrase. Is, is mobile a harder platform to provide protection on versus PC and console? So yes, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. Because on mobile, you also have like multiple di different uh, ar architectures, like talking about ARM64, ARM32, ZX. You have just, then you have all these different NDK versions and also the same then applies for iOS. Yeah, so you generally you just have more to support. So you have to be really flexible there. That's fantastic. Thank you. And, and so one thing that, that springs to my mind from that is we have new legislation coming in here in the UK, the age appropriate design code, which is designed specifically to limit um, the exposure to children from gaming um, across all platforms. 
are you keeping an eye on that kind of legislation? And is this something where you think this is going to make a fairly fundamental change because all of a sudden developers and publishers must look after their younger players? I, I would say that's not really our audience here to really uh, focus on children because what we do is like really taking care of the end client and the APK and ensure that the final APK doesn't get like the final game doesn't get modified. So if hackers now, of course, like patch out children protection stuff, then we would de detect that. But uh, yeah, we, d we don't really target them this kind of stuff. Yeah, no, 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 that, that's understood. No, that's no problem. Um, oh, here's an interesting one. Does machine learning and AI have a, an increasing role to play in helping to spot and identify cheating and hacking? Ah, really great question. Yeah, we had that approach in our anti-cheat solution mm -hmm. so where, we, where we are playing around and also it's also integrated already in uh, production, but of course, that's a, a pretty difficult uh, a problem, but we are, yeah, we are using it. Yeah, that, that's that's great to hear. That, that's really useful to hear. Um, and here's one. Uh, can developers make sure their code is inherently more secure from the outset? Are there widely used techniques they should apply at the design and development stage? Yeah, I guess, as I mentioned in my talk, it's like um, moving game critical logic to the server. There's like a design decision. Like if you have easy functions which return like just gold or decide if you have like the battle is one or not, such a, such um, code should be in general avoided. Or like apply simple obfuscation, right? There are also like obfuscation tools which you can apply directly on C, C++ code and then just this code isn't readable anymore. And Well, I think that's it. You know, you, you, you were really clear and I think that came through in your presentation, which is that, that having things out there in the, in the clear where they can be seen and understood is, is inherently insecure and uh, you know absolutely not best practice so and um, so this ties into the next question which is as games become more and more based on server side and we move towards cloud gaming is this going to have a, a major impact will that be inherently more secure well that depends uh depends where the game is running it's only because it's running on the cloud doesn't make it more secure like if the game is then written in WebAssembly, it's still running in your browser and you could cheat in your browser, it's just the approach is a different one. So, and that's also, we are trying to come up like, because it's moving to the web, we're trying to also move our solutions to the web. That's that's a great, uh, a great point. Um, so here's a question from, from an anonymous attendee. How quickly are we working on anti-cheating software for competitive mobile games? Hmm. Um, working on anti-cheat for competitive mobile games. So yes. in the end, there, there is no such thing like anti-cheat on mobile actually, because what you do is you, you still protect the end client, right? And the modification mm -hmm. happens in the end client. If there is no attacks which are directly facing the server API, then that's yeah. not something we face at the moment, yeah. Okay, no, no that's, that's a great point. And, um, from a legal point of view, whose whose responsibility is it to protect a game? Is it the developer? You know, the is it the publisher? Is it, you know, wh who is fundamentally responsible for making sure that the game is is secure? Well, it's the game publishers, right? Because mm -hmm. every correct game reduces your revenue, so in the in the end, you want to make sure you want to avoid that to get the maximum out of your game. Yeah, no, that that's understood. That's understood. And, and where do you guys see the, the, the most um, attempts, that, that it's the most activity from cheats and hackers? Is it, is it games where you have a, a valuable in-game currency or is it particular genres? Very good question. I think what we notice most is that it's like the in-game currency, right? It's like a game, like more like these casual games, like simple games where you can like just have if you have a lot of in-game currency, you can buy all your in-game stuff. And that's like mm -hmm. the, the most attacks we see. Yeah. And and what's the most what's the most common? Is it is it just is it cheating to try and, and gain an advantage rather than, than hacking to, to steal? 
yeah it's definitely to gain an advantage like yeah mm -hmm. the most common one uh, are those 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 distributed modified uh, android games there's like this huge and this is a huge market and especially in the asian area is gigantic actually so we we had we had a speaker on from Google Play earlier this week, um, who went through an awful lot of changes that are happening in the Google Play marketplace, including a move away from, you know, the, the plain vanilla APKs. Um, so are you are you following this? Is this something that you think might help address that? Uh, moving away from APK, you mean uh, like moving to AABs, right? Yes. Yeah. But that's not a security feature. What it increases is like you get more flexibility and um, like the app size increases. So I understand. Really an improvement in security itself. Ah, okay, okay. Well, see that that that's that's really useful for me because it's uh, I I walked away thinking that security was a part of this, and that's really useful to know. Um, and I, th I think the the last question is. Focusing on the hidden symbols that uh, that you talked about in your presentation, um, can the the uh, anonymous attendee has asked: Can people not copy those hidden symbols as they alter coding for their own gain? Wait, copy the hidden symbols for their own gain? Yeah, uh, for their own gain, for their own advantage. Sorry, for their own gain. Yes. Um, well, once the symbol is hidden, you don't have it. But if the symbol is visible. You just know you know the magic name of the function and then you if you have like a really descriptive function name you know where this function is in the game then you can patch it right so you just want to make sure you avoid all these unneeded exported symbols so. that's fantastic and um, well kurt that that's us um out of time i'm afraid because uh, a really really fascinating exploration of an area that i think more more developers and publishers really should be taking very very seriously as they move forward whatever type of game they're producing thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning it has been absolutely fascinating um look forward to catching up with you on discord and uh, hopefully making sure that uh, everyone who didn't get a, a chance to ask questions or have their questions answered can find you there thanks a lot i will be available on the discord for at least all of the day wonderful thank you again kurt